Okay, now that we've talked about some cell injuries, what causes damage to the cell, now the cell has to adapt to overcome. If it doesn't adapt, then of course it leads to death. So a cell is going to fight as long as it can, just like you. If you're put in a situation where you could potentially die, you're going to fight as long as you can until you can't anymore. That's what a cell does. There are five basic types of cellular adaptation, and you have to know each of the five types and what they are and a good example of them so that when you get put in a situation on the road, something can pop in your mind that triggers these memories. All right, so the first one, actually as we shift through this, is atrophy. And atrophy is when the cell shrinks because it's decreasing in cell size and content, not just because of water loss. So there's this difference. When you learn physiology, you probably learn the term, a cell put in a hypertonic solution will shrink. That's not the same as atrophy. Hypertonic solutions cause water loss from the cell. Atrophy causes like the dense materials, like the proteins to be lost from a cell. So there's a huge difference. This is actually an example of skeletal muscle. So here you have the muscles, and normally the muscles should all be about the same size, but here you see some of them atrophying. They're a lot smaller than the others. It's not that they shrunk because they lost water. You still see the dense material inside of them, the actin, the myosin, but they're just decreased size because they're not used. And there could be a lot of causes. It could be a decreased blood supply to that tissue. If the tissue's starving, it will actually eat itself just to stay alive. So it'll eat the actin and the myosin just to stay alive. When you starve, you do the same thing. If you were trapped somewhere, like in a cave, and you had no access to food, your body would actually start eating itself. It eats its own proteins, it eats its own, um, from muscle, it eats its own fats. So you deplete all of your sugar from your liver, now you're gonna start burning off fat to eat it, but you're also gonna start eating your own muscle. And eventually what happens with people that are starving is that their body starts eating their heart muscle and then they die of a heart attack, so their heart stops. So atrophy can be caused by lack of blood flow, it can be caused of lack of nutrition, so starving itself, same thing. It can be because of a change in hormones. If you don't have hormones that nurture those cells and tell those cells you need to eat and get bigger, then the cells won't. They shrink in size. If it's a muscle cell, a skeletal muscle, you know muscle, skeletal muscle cells are innervative, which means they have to be controlled by a neuron. If you cut that neuron supply off, then that muscle can't contract anymore. And if it's not being used, it will shrink down. So it's is an example of a cast. If you put your arm in a cast and you can't move your arm around, what happens to that arm over the month or so that you have the cast on? It starts shrinking in muscle mass. So when you take the cast off, one arm will actually be a little bit bigger than the other one because the one that was immobile atrophied. Here's one of the results or things that it can be an outcome of atrophy. You can actually accumulate things called lipofusin. So you, you can have cellular accumulations. You can accumulate calcium, you can accumulate things called myelin figures, but lipofusin is one you want to pay attention to because the way it works is kind of interesting. If the cell starts atrophying, it starts eating itself, so it has to increase a specific organelle that's really good at eating inside the cell. What's that organelle inside of cells that breaks down debris, breaks down bacteria, breaks down other things like that? It's the lysosome. So now you have excessive lysosomes, and the lysosomes are just eating everything. They're eating fats, and the problem is that fats don't get digested by a cell very well. So now they're eating all these weird fats from like the lipid membrane, um, from structures inside the cell, cholesterol's in there, and they start making this stuff called lipofusin. And the lipofusin can't be processed, can't get rid of, so it accumulates in the cell and it has this like yellowish brown color. And here you can see some cardiac muscle with lipofusin accumulated in it. So starvation, when the cell starts eating itself, it will start accumulating these little, well, accumulations inside the cell. And a lipofusin is an example. Another example where you can actually see lipofusin on the outside of the body are liver spots. So this is a little bit different process. When your skin's exposed to UV radiation, it destroys the cell membrane. Those lipids go inside the cell, and then the lysosome processes the lipids and turns them into lipofusin where they sit there. Since you can't get rid of them, they just start accumulating. So these weakened cells that are exposed to a lot of UV exposure start accumulating these things called liver spots. So a little bit different than atrophy, but it's the same process. Here are just some other pictures of lipofusin. So here's some in uh, um, cardiac muscle. Again, you can see cardiac because it's branching. It's not skeletal. Here you can see it in the liver. Here's an example of what happens to tissues when they atrophy. In this example, uh, the guy had a cut that went across his shoulder, and he wasn't able to use his arm because it cut the nerve. So his arm was limp 
limp and dangling and couldn't use it. So you can see how, you know, how atrophied it is, how shrunken it is. In this situation, the blood and circulation got cut off to the liver, so this liver is atrophied, or liver. I can't believe I just said that. This kidney, kidney is atrophied. So I know my anatomy. Anyway, you can see here's a normal sized kidney and here's the atrophied kidney. And I just have a couple examples here where you can see it a little bit closer and you can definitely see how it's wasting away. Just comparative when you look at the size of the veins compared to the rest of the muscle. And then there's that quote unquote liver. Oops, my mistake. So kidney. Uh, here's another example. So brains. Here you can see a normal brain. You can see how all the gyri and sulci are nice and densely packed. So everything's packed in there. And this is an Alzheimer brain. You can see how spread apart the gyri are and how, how deep the sulci are in, in this brain. But in Alzheimer's, what happens is that Alzheimer's doesn't just attack the neurons and cause plaques. It also causes plaques in the blood vessels, which decreases blood flow. The decreased blood flow causes shrinkage of regions of the brain. You can see um, in this Alzheimer, Alzheimer brain, it's primarily the frontal lobe that's shrunken. Uh, down here is an example of two testes. So... Uh, this testis is shrunken compared to the other one. Right. Next, hypertrophy. So instead of atrophy, which means, by the way, A without trophic means to nurture. Without nurturing, it shrinks. Hypertrophy means increased or excessive nurturing, so they're bigger. And, of course, hypertrophy doesn't always have to be a pathology or a disease. Hypertrophy, when somebody works out really hard, their muscles become hypertrophic. They're not growing new muscle fibers. They're just making the existing fibers bigger. So hypertrophy results in a cell size increase. It's not swelling because there's too much water. It's because there's actually more muscle mass or more, more structures like proteins accumulating in here. Some disease hypertrophy would be like cardiac hypertrophy. Of course, the left ventricle is going to be a little bit more muscular and dense than the right ventricle, but this is excessive buildup. So there's way too much protein synthesis. In this situation, the person's heart was working way too hard to try and pump blood, most likely because of a bad valve. So if you have a valve that doesn't open completely, the heart has to work harder to push harder. Anytime you work a muscle harder, it gets bigger. So the heart actually gets hypertrophic, which can become problematic. So you can just see volume-wise, it's not going to be able to move the same volume. Another place you see hypertrophy is the kidney. And the, the kidney, if one kidney has a problem, the other one will increase its size, not number of nephrons, but the size of the kidney to try and uh, accommodate. Next is hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is increased in number, not the same as hypertrophic. Hypertrophic means the size gets bigger. Hyperplasia means you get more of the cells. So hyperplasia, a really good example or a common example you'll see would be prostate. So here's an example of a prostate. And the prostate should actually only be less than three centimeters across. So, well, three to four centimeters across typically. But you can see this one goes way beyond. This is a five centimeter ruler. And it hangs over on this side, hangs over on this side. So it's extremely enlarged. And what's happening here is they have hyperplasia of the prostate. So a hyperplastic prostate. And the problem, big problem is that if you remember what goes through the prostate would be the urethra coming from the bladder and also the ejaculatory ducts. So if you have too many cells, it starts compressing those two pathways. And of course, you're going to be able to predict the symptoms. If those pathways get smashed, what are the two problems a person's going to have? It's going to have a problem with ejaculation and a problem with urination. You usually don't see hyperplasia in places like cardiac, skeletal muscle, or nerves. And think about that a second. Why do you not see an increase in number in nerves, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle? Because those three types of cells don't replicate once they've been um, differentiated. So once they're adult cardiac muscle, they don't replicate. When you have a heart attack, you don't just grow new heart because you can't replicate those. So typically you don't see hyperplasia in those three areas. You might see hypertrophic tissue, swollen tissue, but not typically hyperplasia. Sometimes hyperplasia can be normal, like compensatory hyperplasia can be kind of normal. Uh, a good example of mechanical compensatory is if you work with your hands all day and you use tools, the friction on those tools on your hand cause what to start forming on your hand? A callus. A callus is a good example of compensatory hyperplasia. It can be hormonal, hormonal hyperplasia. So think about the uterus. During the cycle, estrogen and progesterone cause the uterus to start 
increasing the number of cells. So it starts growing. That's a normal situation. So that's not pathologic. Um, another good example would be, a, a, well, the pathologic one would be a hemangioma, which means a blood vessel is enlarged. And this they call a strawberry hemangioma. And lots of babies are born with these. And usually by the time they're three, they actually go away. But what it is is a bunch of hyperplastic blood vessels. So you see lots of blood and, and cells in there. So these, they're different, um, but they're not necessarily always a pathology. Uh, some other times you see a pathologic would be if something like this happened in the brain. So if you have hyperplasia of blood vessels in the brain, it's going to compress the brain. Oops, somehow I skipped over something. Oh, there we go. So the next group, metaplasia. Metaplasia, this is kind of an interesting one because it doesn't fall into atrophic, hypertrophic, or hyperplasia. This is that the cells change their shape. They actually get replaced with one type of cell to another type of cell. So uh, like probably the best example or a common example are in smokers. So here you can see a nice, normal, healthy respiratory tract. You see all the ciliated columnar epithelium going all the way along here. And the reason you have that cilia is to try and carry debris up through the mucus and clear it away. But when a smoker starts smoking, you'll actually see this become metaplastic, which means that usually these change, so they're no longer columnar ciliated epithelium. They're actually stratified squamous, so almost like regular skin. They're thick but they have no cilia. So think about what kind of problem that causes. With metaplasia, they don't have the cilia to try and clear up debris. So what happens is when a smoker lays down at night, normally when you and I lay down at night, we clear like dust and debris away from our airway. And in the morning, you know, maybe you have a booger or something. But with people that have, um, are smokers, they have all that tar-like debris, all those chemicals from the smoke and the toxin lining the respiratory tract. And since the cilia can't clear it up, it all pools at the back of their throat since they're laying flat. And in the morning, they start, <coughs> <coughs> they start trying to spit it up and they try and hock a loogie. Uh, they call them tar plugs. And it's because they have this metaplasia happening in their airway. And all that stuff accumulates along this nice, smooth, flat epithelium instead of having it ciliated that's trying to carry away the debris. Uh, the good thing is that this can be reversible. As long as it's metaplasia, it can actually reverse. So if they quit smoking, it starts reverting back to its original ciliated columnar epithelium. Uh, up here, you can see some metaplasia in the stomach lining. So this is actually the antrum of the stomach. And you can see some of the color changes. So they have some metaplastic cells. And this could have been caused by anything. It could have been caused by actually smoking. So smoking could have gotten in there and chemicals could have started changing. It could be um, acids that are getting to the epithelial lining and changing these cells, but it's metaplastic. So the key here is with metaplasia, it can actually be reversed and go back to normal. All right, when it doesn't go back to normal, then we call it dysplasia. Dysplasia, every time I see the word dys, I always think dysfunctional, abnormal, problematic. This is a problem. So metaplasia can be reversible. Dysplasia is not. Dysplasia, instead of replacing one cell with a different type of cell, Dysplasia, you replace a normal cell with an unknown type of cell. It's just a really strange cell. And typically, they look like stem cells. So something's going on here that's making them start going through mitosis all over again. They start rapidly replicating. They're changing, and they have these abnormal shapes. Dysplasias are typically associated with cancers. So we also call them neoplasias, so new abnormal growths and they usually indicate a cancerous growth. So dysplasia becomes very bad. And this is actually a cervical squamous epithelium that's dysplastic, it's, it's been changed. And I thought I had a zoom in, I guess I don't. Uh, actually, we'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slide, but with dysplasia is problematic. Typically cancer is what you wanna re remember. And then, whoops, I have a typo here. How does this differ from metaplasia is what this should say. So remember, metaplasia is reversible, dysplasia is not. Metaplasia means that one cell is replaced with another type of cell. Dysplasia means that one cell is actually replaced with this abnormal looking cell that looks like a stem cell. In other words, this thing is mutated. 
it's changed and now it's reverting back to its its stem cell like state where it can rapidly replicate and become anything at once. So it becomes very problematic. And where you're going to hear this more commonly or most commonly is when you hear about um, people having a pap smear or um, when people are having a colonoscopy and they find a, a little piece of tissue and they take a biopsy. A lot of times we'll talk about whether it's metaplastic tissue or dysplastic tissue. In this situation, you can see that normally the cervix, this is a normal looking cervix, but they can see little, little spots all over, which are signs of either metaplastic or dysplastic tissue. So if they see these signs, then they'll actually go in, they'll take a biopsy of the tissue, and then they'll look at it. If the tissue just looks like another cell, but maybe a different type, so maybe it looked like, originally it looked like uh, squamous cells, and now suddenly it looks like, um, you know, cuboidal, then that might be an example of metaplasia. If it looks like simple squamous and now it looks like more like columnar, you know, in the wrong place, so columnar is normally as you go deeper into the uterus, but it starts changing a little bit, then it's still metaplasia. If the cells start looking originally like this, but now they have like multiple nuclei, they look like they have fragmented nuclei, they look totally abnormal and nothing like the original cells, then it's dysplasia and then they have to worry about it. And they'll go back in and they'll actually remove all that tissue because these are potential cancer cells. And I put a, a little link down here across the bottom that you can go to and read a little bit more about it. So it's a really good link. All right, so metaplasia versus dysplasia. Your book actually has a picture that looks like this. So if this were your airway, the example I showed a little bit earlier, and you can see all the columnar ciliated epithelium, right? If it's metaplasia, then it starts changing. Here's your stratified squamous epithelium. This is smooth, slippery, so that debris just slides down to the back of their throat, and then they wake up with those tar plugs, right? If they keep smoking and it starts mutating these cells, if these cells start mutating, and now look, they're going through mitosis. You can see the different phases. So you can see some anaphase going on here. You can see some telophase going on. You can see all these different phases. I'm looking for some uh, metaphase where you see the plate down in the middle, but I can't find a good example of that. But when you see all these different phases that are happening that look like original stem cells going through mitosis again, then it's a sign of dysplasia. This means that this is going to be an abnormal growth and it will potentially become cancer. So metaplasia versus dysplasia. And then the last slide of the material is, when does adaptation end is a really good question. Uh, we call it the point of no return. So how long would these cells handle it? And it, I usually get this all the time when people go, well, geez, you know, how long can you smoke before it com becomes cancer? You know, if we knew that, we'd put a, pack, uh, a little line in the package of, of cigarettes that says, you have blank number of months before this becomes cancer. So if you want to be stupid and smoke, then this is how long you have before it becomes deadly. So we really don't know what's the point of no return. It has a lot to do with other factors in the environment, some genetics. But the line in the sand, wherever that line is, anything before that line we refer to as reversible. So your cells will adapt. They draw on their reserves. In other words, they'll eat themselves. They'll, they'll eat their own proteins, their own carbs, and stay alive as long as they can. They'll adapt to change, like we saw in metaplasia, where they'll adapt cell types. So they may have started as a columnar cell with cilia, but they downsized to be a, a, a stratified squamous cell, where they didn't have to use all that extra energy for moving cilia, and they didn't have to use all that extra space for building cilia. They adapted. And then when you take away whatever that injury causing agent, then they start changing back to the normal cells because they can return to the normal function. That's reversible. That would be examples of atrophy, hypertrophy, shrinking back down to its normal size after it, it enlarged would be hypertrophy reversing. Atrophy, getting back to its normal size before, after it shrunk. Um, metaplasia, changing back to its original cells. Those are all reversible situations. Right? Irreversible is when it crosses that line in the sand. Now this the cell said, I've done this for as long as I can. I've eaten every piece of tissue inside the cell I can to sustain life, and now you know, it's time to die. So that cell will, will either shrivel up and die or go through a process called apoptosis, which is basically cell suicide, and we'll talk about in the next video. So we don't, like I said, we don't know what the point of no return is, but you don't want to cross it. So if you're a smoker, a good idea is stop now. If you're drinking a lot of alcohol on a regular basis, back off the alcohol. You know, 
textbooks say one drink a day is, is fine because there are actually some benefits to like red wine, but excessive alcohol consumption is pushing the cells to the point of no return. At what point will your liver cells not be able to fix themselves and become a sclerotic liver? And then the final question right here. So you can go ahead and pause, write these down, but I just want you to go through and make your own review of the slides. So what is atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, dysplasia, and metaplasia? And just give me one common example, either one I gave um, in the lectures or one from the textbook.